We ready? All right. All right, thanks everybody for waiting. Uh, I know the keynote was, you know, went a little bit longer, so they said that we can take our full hour. So we're gonna go through the presentation here, ask questions. Um, we really wanna make this uh, interactive over Wave. So uh, there's this URL here. Um, there's gonna be a lot of content that I'm gonna be presenting today. Uh, if you have questions, we have a lot of people who are gonna be answering the questions online, and then we'll go back up and uh, I'll ask the questions as well. So my name is Nick Mihailovsky. Uh, I'm a lead on our developer relations for Google Analytics. I've been, I was actually at Urchin Software, and I've been working on Google Analytics for five years. Um, we're really excited to talk about a lot of things that we're doing here for developers. This is our first year at Google I.O., even though we've, uh, we've had analytics out for five years. Um, so just, just to give a show of hands, how many people here uh, use Google Analytics today? All right, everybody uses it, okay. Uh, so, so show of hands again, how many people feel like they use it in very sophisticated ways? Like you, you guys think you're doing a lot and you're getting a lot of information out of it. Okay, it's a lot to your hands, great. Well, you know, we heard earlier today in the keynote, we heard Vic and Dotra talking about how important analytics is. We heard Eric talking about analytics as well. Measuring the performance of your applications is critical for you to be successful in your business. Now, traditionally, in most presentations, we talk about the business side of how to use data. But here at Google I.O., we're really reaching out to developers. So I'm gonna talk, you, uh, talk to you a little bit about what we're doing with the platform, what we're building to enable developers like you to do really exciting new things that you've never been able to do before. So when we look at what do we really want people to do with analytics, there's really three areas, and I'm gonna talk through you today throughout the pre presentation of what we're doing around this. Developers really wanna know exactly what data Google Analytics collects, how we process the data, so they can interpret what is actually going on in the reports that we show them. Developers wanna take our code and extend it to new environments, like TV and mobile, as well as extend our reports so you can do amazing, better, badder, and exciting visualizations with the data you've never been able to do before. And finally, developers wanna take the data that you can get out of analytics, take the web analytics data, and integrate that with their business analytics data to get new insights and do innovative new things that, again, we've never been able to do before. This presentation is gonna walk you through how we're actually accomplishing that today. So when most people think of Google Analytics, they think of just signing up for a brand new account getting a piece of tracking code that they slap on the, the footer of their page, and automatically you see really pretty reports. And I'm sure everybody here has gone through that because you pretty much all raised your hand when I said how many people use Google Analytics. So I want you today to not just think of that, I want you to think today of four major components that we have. A core processing component, a management component, a data collection component, and a data export component. These are the four main components, and we're gonna talk through exactly how we're enabling developers to integrate through each of these pieces. So how many of you have seen page views and visits data in your reports? Right. So how many of you actually know how we calculate those metrics? All right, sort of, right? So the truth of the matter is businesses today are using this data to justify the success of what they're doing online. But in truth, very few people actually know how we're calculating this information. And for developers, that's really frustrating because what you're trying to do is guess all the time of what's going on and you're sending us data and you're seeing these results that you're really not sure how they got there and it's just really frustrating. So today I wanna to give you a sneak peek. We're gonna pull back the curtain of what we've always hidden of our core processing engine. I'm gonna tell you exactly how Google Analytics collects data. I'm gonna talk about a brand new model that we're just gonna start just touching on on how we calculate all the data. And it's gonna be really exciting because once you understand this, it's gonna make you understand uh, how analytics works. So when you log into your reports, you typically see a report that just looks like this. This can be broken down into a series of dimensions and metrics, where metrics are numeric values, for example, like the number of page views, and dimensions are a set of strings, for example, like the page path. Now, Google Analytics has a ton of these metrics, over 175 metrics that we expose. 
But again, we don't really tell you how we calculate them. You just look at the reports. You say, we increased paid views after we've released a brand new product. Everybody's successful. They go to the bar and celebrate. We're really not sure what those page views really mean. So let's blow off the covers. Let's talk about how Google Analytics works today. Here are four main components. When you log into Analytics for the first time, you get a piece of tracking code in the management section, which you then put on your site, and it sends this data in which you could think of as logs. We then take all the configuration information from your account, your goal configuration, your profile information, and we put that into a data structure. And this is where the magic happens. We take all these data structures and pass them through a series of functions where the return value of each function is the actual dimension of the metric. This then gets stored in a table, and this processing happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. We were just laughing yesterday at lunch. We were saying, how many times are we processing and collecting all the data from the people at Google I.O.? Probably a lot. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and you look at your reports after the announcements you've made here, you, you'll log into your reports or user data export API. You'll query your uh, back end, and you'll get a set of reports. And the key thing here to know that the main processing part is that when you're using functions, and each dimension and metric can be defined as an as a actual function. And that's it. I mean, isn't that easy? There's just six steps to all the data that we're processing. So let's take a, a look through exactly how this works in a little bit more detail. What we first want to understand is for all the data that we're processing, what is this data we're actually looking at? And you can think of it as a simple visitor interaction model where a visit, visitor, visits a site and views a bunch of pages. They might revisit the site and view a couple more pages interact with content like events, or actually make transactions on your site. In Google Analytics, we call this the visitor session and hit levels. Now, when a visitor visits a site that's being tracked with GA, with the JavaScript tracking code, each time you make a tracking request, an invisible one-by-one -one pixel image sends data to Google Analytics. Now, all the tracking library is doing is putting a bunch of query parameters at the end of this request. And as a visitor comes to your site, you'll see the queries being sent. And over time, multiple queries will be being sent as well. Now, our tracking code has logic that persists certain values across each of these requests to represent the visitor, the session, and the hit. Now, your site sits on the World Wide Web. And so people are coming to it from exotic places, places like Zanzibar and Bahrain. They're sending logs all the time. And so from our side, we just see a series of these requests all out of order. So our backing goes and reconstructs the sessions and the hits based upon the values that we persisted in the tracking code. Now you could think of this as a session entity with an array of hits. Google Analytics will then go through each session and through each hit within each session and pass the session and the index of each hit to the series of functions that calculates dimensions and metrics. Let's take a look at how visits are calculated. Now, at the bottom, we have four hits that were created for a session. A visitor came to the page foo, they went to page bar, they did an e-commerce transaction, and finally, they went back to page foo. So what we do is we pass this whole session entity with each index, and we pass it to this function called visits. If the index is zero, we return one, otherwise we return zero. And so in the example below, we count one, for all these hits. What that means is visits count the number of session in Google Analytics. And that's exactly what we're doing. Let's take a look at how we calculate dimensions. Now, dimensions are strings, like I, uh, I told you earlier. Here, across all the pages, when we pass it to this function, we index into the hit, and there's a type called page. And if, there, if we hit a page, we actually return the page path, foo, bar, or foo. Otherwise, we turn an empty string. So for each dimension and metric, the key part is that there's a function that can be applied that explains exactly how that data is calculated. If you think back, you could say, hey, well then, there's probably a parameter in the queries that are being sent through a utm.gif request. And that query value is being set by a certain parameter in the browser, the URL. We think this new model is really important because it's going to explain exactly how the data is being calculated, how it's being transmitted, 
and you'll be able to interpret your reports much more cleaner than you currently can today. Now that's all I'm going to be talking about functions, just a real sneak peek. If you have more questions, now's a great time to go to the Google Wave, and we'll answer them after uh, the session, after I'm done talking. So we just talked a lot about what we're doing. Now I want to talk about you. What are we doing for developers? We just talked about this really powerful processing engine that we're uncovering and telling you how it's working. How are you going to integrate with that today? Well, across our four main components, we're exposing a set of data fields that you can send as information. We're exposing a set of protocols that you can send and export your data. And we have a bunch of client libraries that make it really simple for you to track. I'm going to go through this section really fast. All of this data that you probably already read on code.google.com, APIs, analytics, you can go there and, and learn more about it. But I just wanted to show you how powerful this is, especially on the data collection. Here are all the types of data that you can collect. Standard page views, event. We, we just released custom variables that which allow you to explain this information. All the data gets sent over the UTM GIF request, what we just looked at. What I really want to focus on is how many client libraries that we have today. Most of you have just think of the JavaScript tracking code. We recently released the new hotness to track the Android applications. So all the stuff that Vic and Docha talked about, how exciting it is to build apps, you guys need to measure how successful your apps are to make them better. You can use Google Analytics to do that today. We released new code so you can track mobile websites that don't enable JavaScript for older WAP phones. So if you're targeting Asian audiences or, or markets where they don't really have the smartphone technology yet, you can still track that with the analytics. We heard in the keynote that where Google is really embracing Flash. We actually worked with Adobe two years ago to build a complete tracking library for all Flash that's native to ActionScript 3. It works in Flex, Flash, Air. We even work with Microsoft to, to, to track Silverlight, if you so choose to. A lot of libraries. Most people don't know how much you can actually use analytics. Let's take a look at account management. Now, this is the part that has all the configuration data in Google Analytics. This is really important if you want to make sure that your account's configured. We provide an API to export all this information. It's currently read-only. We actually just, um, for all the libraries, we just released updates to the .NET library. So if you're a big .NET shop, you can start using that. And we have three uh, user-contributed libraries for Ruby, Perl, and PHP. And there's, they're really uh, powerful. You know, there's some people who have been doing some amazing visualizations using the Ruby library just because it's so simple. Now, the real exciting part is being able to access all your data. So for that, we have a data export API that exposes dimensions and metrics. We just talked about how all of those are calculated. But what's really interesting is the protocol that we're using to do this. The protocol uses Google data. And the query language to access all your data is very rich. You pretty much have access to about 90% of all the data in your reports. And it's so simple. You can make exotic queries, for example, like show me the number of visits who spend more than five minutes, who come from Nepal, who buy blue swimming trucks for more than $100. Now, I don't really know who in Nepal buys swimming trunks that are very expensive. But if they do, you can query for it and find it out in your own reports. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you a quick demo on exactly how powerful our query language is. If you go on our code site, we provide a simple tool called a Query Explorer. Here's our code section. You can see it's uh, code.google.com, APIs, analytics. Uh, it's over here under the feed reference in the Query Explorer. And you guys can log into this right now and play around with it. Everything has, uh, you know, there's nice drill downs that show me all the accounts that I have. There's information of all the queries we have. We have all our metrics here, and you can see all the information. Let's just start looking at a couple queries to show you what we can do. So let's just quickly look at visits. Here we're going to quickly get the data. There it is. That's how much visits we're getting to the Google Store for the period of uh, May 6th through May 20th. Now let's add a dimension to that. Let's take a look at the number of uh, the different cities across the globe. Here we're looking at dimensions and metrics uh, for all the different cities. Now we could specify different filters. Let's say we want to say. We want to say the country equals, let's say the country has a regular expression that it starts with United. 
Here we're getting a list of all the cities in the United States. In the filter expression, we can use an and. We could say, show me all the cities that are where the city is California. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> All right. All right. So we'll say city. <laughs> We're really agile. We'll, we'll mix up the example really here. It starts with M. OK. So here's all the countries that start with United, where the city starts with M. Let's now take a look at, maybe we want to do this by, uh, we want to take a look at the different keywords. We could jump in here and take a look at uh, keyword. Here's all the different keywords. Maybe we want to take a look at the segment and only look at new visitors. Let's get that data. And so, with the, there it is. And here we're looking at new visits. And then we could come in here. We can say maybe we want to sort by visits, descending. So you get the picture here. You can play with all your data. This tool is available. It's really simple to use. And it just really shows you the power of how quickly you can get access to all your data, how you can display it in new ways, and really have a, a quick way to, to start analyzing your data in, in new environments. So if you have any questions about our platform and the core pieces of what we're providing, please ask them on WAVE uh, or ask them after the question. Again, we just want to spend a short time. All this information, you probably have already read it. If you haven't, you should go read it after, after this session. So now I want to talk about what we're enabling developers on what they can start building on this platform that we're building around our core processing engine. So most people use Google Analytics to collect data so they can analyze, make changes to their site, and uh, improve the performance of what their website's doing today. Now when most people do that, they start running into issues like there's too much data, they don't have enough time, and finally for the people who are able to actually great, get great insights and make changes and improvements, that process really doesn't scale well. So what if you could build a program that automatically improves the performance for you? This example will teach you exactly how to do that using the GA platform. So let's take an example of a list of links. Here's somebody who has a sitemap on their page, and they've organized them into some categories. But are these really the best way to order this list of links? Who knows? This is more of a gut feeling. Now, people are coming to this site every day. They're clicking on the links of what interests them, what interests them the most. So how about we use Google Analytics to track the number of times people click on each of these links and then order them into something that would be a lot more relevant than they are today? This example will demonstrate exactly how to do that. Now, from a technical example, from a technical perspective, what this example is really showing you is how you can integrate Google Analytics with your content management, e-commerce platform, with your business intelligence information by passing in a common set of IDs into Google Analytics and then exporting all the performance data by those IDs so you can do amazing new things with them that you couldn't have done before. Let's take a look at how a content management would, uh, site would display a set of links on a, a bunch of pages. Now, you guys are all really advanced developers at Google I.O., so we're not going to show you the actual code to do this. But simply, uh, you know, there's a table that has link URLs and text. Each of them have a primary key. Your content management issues a SQL query that gets all the data and displays a list of links on the pages. Now, for the purpose of this example, the most important part is that the primary key is being passed and set in the name attribute of each link. That way, when we track it later on, we'll have that ID, and we can pass it into Google Analytics. So I have a PHP running here with a, with a MySQL database that I'm creating a list of links here on the site. If you take a look at the source, here's our name attribute that has the ID, which is our primary key in our database. 
and it's just a bunch of listed links. Pretty simple. So let's take a look at how we will pass that information into Google Analytics and how we start tracking. So here's our list of links that we looked at before. <clears throat> and there's three steps that we're going to do. We're going to implement the tracking code. We're going to set this ID in what we call a custom variable. And we're going to pass that data to analytics using an event. Let's take a look at the code and see exactly how that works. So the first part of the code, and here, here you can see just the top of the file. Um, the first part of the code is just imp implementing the tracking code. Now, we recently released something called asynchronous tracking. Now, Google is obsessed with making the web faster. And so the async speeds up your page. By default, with our traditional snippet, a browser will, with traditional JavaScript, a browser will make a request for JavaScript, and it'll wait, and it won't execute anything until the request comes back and starts executing the tracking code. With our async, you can make this request for the Google Analytics tracking code in parallel, allowing your page to continue rendering. And finally, when the request comes back, we execute the script and go on. So what this means is that you can start issuing commands of tracking before the script has even loaded. And that allows you to put the script at the top of the page and make sure that you're collecting all your data. So let's quickly walk through what's going on in this uh, script here. We're first creating an array um, so that we can save a lot of commands. Now, the way that we're tracking here is we're pushing arrays onto the array, where each the first parameter is the actual method that we're tracking. And all the parameters are actually the values that get passed into those functions. This in and of itself doesn't do any tracking, but allows us to say, this is what we want to be tracked once our script is loaded. Now, down below, we have a self-executing function that will asynchronously load this tracking script onto the page. Once the script's loaded, it'll go back to the array. It'll pull out all the commands. It'll replace the GAC array with a GAC tracking object, execute the commands, and for any subsequent request to analytics, it'll go directly and make those UTM GIF requests. And that's, and that's it. I mean, you pretty much copy and paste. This is what you're doing. You know, we make this ridiculously easy. I don't have much more to talk about it because we just make it that easy. So now let's go into the section where we're actually sending uh, events and custom variables into Google Analytics, which is this section here. Now, for each click, we're doing two things. We're passing two commands, a set custom variable and a track event. Before we get into each of these, how many people here have used custom variables? Great. Custom variables is super powerful. What it allows you to do is send two strings to Google Analytics to describe either a visitor, a session, or a hit level. So what that means is if you have a person who comes to your site and you have some sort of a membership, you can assign them a custom variable for the membership that specifies if they're a gold, bronze, or silver customer. You can assign a custom variable to a page level or a hit level. For example, in a content uh, site where you're having a lot of different articles, maybe you want to group the different pages by author. In this case, the first string you would send is the, uh, the name author. And in the actual, the name of the author is the value. What that means is when you look in your reports, you can find out the total number of pages by these custom groupings. So the way we send this information to Google Analytics is we call a set custom variable uh, method. The second parameter that we pass is there are five custom variables that you can send at any one given time. So here we'll use the first custom variable. Here we'll use the name top links. And here we'll pass the name attribute, which in this case is our link ID. Now this is the key part here, is that we're using a custom variable to pass an ID which represents the primary key in our database. This is the magic. This is the advanced way to use analytics. The second part of this method is to track an event. How many people here know about event tracking? Events allow you to track interactions with your content. Traditionally, we've only had page views. But with Web 2.0, we have a lot of rich applications that we want to track how many people click the poke me now button on Facebook. This is why we came out with event tracking not for just tracking poke me buttons, but to track any sort of interaction with your content. If you have a mobile site, you can, use tracking, you can use event tracking to track the number of times people do clicks. And it's a way that you can send your own data into analytics. In this case, we use events just to send a custom variable. We pass one string as the top links. 
and we pass the inner HTML value, which is the value within the uh, link tag here. That makes it really easy for us to interpret the reports. So when we take a look at this page that we're tracking, just go back for a second. Okay. Here we have all the commands that are being added on here for each of the clicks. And finally, if we open up uh, Firebug here, request the page, here we see the UTM GIF parameter for a page view we track, and for each of these, you can now see these UTM GIF parameters being sent to Google Analytics. So now we're, being collect we're collecting data, and you can actually come into each of these, and you can actually see the actual data we're tracking. This UTM E parameter has all the information, and if you can see it, if you have really good eyesight, you can see that we're tracking top links, we're tracking the string inside of it, and we're tracking the actual link ID, which is our primary key. Now what I've showed you is how to use Firebug. You can use developer tools in Chrome, but tracking the actual request to analytics is a great way to troubleshoot your uh, implementations. Instead of waiting 24 hours for your data to be processed, you can be assured that if you're sending us data, we'll be processing your data. So use the tools like this to make sure that you're debugging and that your code is actually working properly. All right. So we just talked about how we're sending data into GA. Now what we want to do is export the times, all that information and store it in our database. So the process we're going to do is this two-step approach. We're going to create a Java application that's going to be able to be scheduled, and it's going to go out to Google Analytics using our data export API. It's going to pull all the relevant data for us and store it into a database. Then on the client side, when it makes requests for this page of links, we'll hit our server, it'll just hit our local database and return that to the end user. Going through this process is, is really simple. Um, the, the first part that I want to really talk about and focus on is how we map the tracking code to our data export API query. So we just talked about setting custom variables where we set the first custom variable, we pass it two strings, the name of the custom variable, top links, and the value is the ID, which is our primary key. So when we look at the data export API query, we first want to set a filter where we're only looking at data for the first custom variable whose name is top links. We then want to set the dimensions to look at the first custom variable value, which is our primary key. And finally, we want to look at total events. So notice here that we're using custom variables to track the dimensions, but we're using event tracking to track the number of metrics. How many people have a configuration set up like this? Let's take a look at the code now that it shows us how we export our data into our database. Now here's a simple Java application. In our main method, we create a new example, and we run the main example by passing all the arguments. There's five steps. There's, we're first going to configure the date range so we can schedule this as a cron job. We're then going to create a MySQL database connection. You guys all know how to do that with JDBC. We'll then use a, create, uh, retrieve a Google Analytics service object. Now, this is the object that allows you to access all the data in Google Analytics. We'll then get the data, and then we'll update the database with our information. Now, this code, we're going to write an article. We'll, we'll open source the code. You'll be able to take it, put it in your own environments. So today, I'm only going to talk about the most important part that's relevant to GA, which is how we get the get analytics service object. And we're going to show you how ridiculously easy it is to actually make queries to our API. So here's the method where we're getting the service object. This analytics service class is in our Java client library. You can get it online. You pass it the name attribute of your application, or name string, or string, and you get an object back. In this case, we need to authorize access to the API. So we're going to use a method called client login. Now this application is going to sit on our server. It's going to be running every day, every week, every month. Nobody's going to be having to authenticate. So we just use client login to pass the username and password. And at that point, we have an object that we can actually access our API. It's that simple. Let's now look at how we use the object to get data. The first part is specifying a URL that defines the endpoint of analytics. We create a new query object by passing in the URL. We then specify which profile we want to access, the start and end date range. And here we set our filters, dimensions, and metrics. 
what we just looked at. Finally, we set the sort. And now, for the analytic service object, we call the get feed member. Let me just pull this up. We pass in the query. We pass in the class. And boom, the feed result has all the data from analytics. It's that simple. Once we call this line, magic happens. Data is returned. You guys can do amazing stuff. It's super easy to use. And the problem I have explaining this is so easy that I don't have that much. No, most of the time, I'd speak around how you can set this into the database. Uh, it's, it's hard to find really great examples because it's just so easy. So now we have our data in the database. The last step is to use that information. Here was the original table that we looked at that had the primary key of the link ID. Our original query just got the link name, the URL, and the text. Our example just created a new table and uploaded the total events by that primary key. And now we can update the query to join on the ID and order results by the total events. Now, this is a really simple example. But the implications are powerful. What we were able to do is say, for the number of times people clicked on their site, we were able to track that user behavior and then present a brand new experience to them based on what people have done the most on your site. Now imagine you have an e-commerce site that has a list of products. What products should you show people? Should, would you order them by alphabetical order, by color? What if you used the ordering by how many people go to certain product pages when they search for the word shoes and order a list of products based on what people visit the most. That's what you can do with this information. So on top of all this stuff that we're building for people, what I really am excited about is that we're really putting a lot of resources to build out our developer ecosystem. We think there's amazing new things people can do we're putting, um, we just released an app gallery that shows the type of integrations that people have done. Uh, we're inviting our developers to come speak at conferences. We have two people out in the sandbox. We have Juice Analytics and ShufflePoint who can walk you through all the exciting things that they've done with the data and the type of integrations that they're able to do. We're doing blog posts where I personally will write about your application and give it to our 50,000 readers on our blog. We really are excited about the new stuff that you can do on how you can integrate Google Analytics data with your business data to create brand new insights. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up to the mic. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Yep. Hi. Uh, so it, it was very interesting uh, when you walked through this uh, whole process of uh, tracking, sending the tracking data to the analytics, the <clears throat> exporting them, uh, displaying them in the database, it's, it's, it's all great. Now, I, I just, I, I'm just wondering, if I just track those URLs on my site, just put them into database, increment the counter, and then use these <clears throat> as the result without just going all these round trips to the analytics and back, would that work? Probably yes. So why, why to do the whole, uh, the whole thing, and uh, what are the advantages of doing this? That's a great question. So, th so the question, if I, can, if I can repeat it, what you're asking is saying, there's two ways to export data. One of is a two-step approach by putting all this stuff into a local database. And the other option is just querying our API directly for each request. No. My no. question is, I own the data. Sure. So I have it in my database. So I can just calculate it in my database without going to analytics and just present to my users. Exactly. So you have the data in your database. But yeah. what we have is the engine to allow you to track how users interact with the content that your database is serving. So but for example, I'm serving the content. Sure. With my application. So I know how, how I am serving the content. Right. But do you know how people are interacting with, how many people are clicking on link A? How many people are going to product B? And how, are, how many people from search keyword shoes are clicking on those compared to people on search keyword okay. t-shirt? So that kind of visibility into being able to query against all these dimensions and metrics gives you new views into the data, that, which you can definitely build yourself. But why build it yourself when you can get it for free? Thanks. I have two uh, feature request-y kind of questions. Uh, and I, of course, I'm not expecting you to announce anything, but I'm sort of curious to hear your attitude about them and maybe gesture towards when I might be likely to see them. Uh, the, the two features, uh, first, real-time analytics, or at least 
less than 24 hours time analytics. Uh, and the second, uh, data portability. I, I've given you guys a lot of data, and I wish I could get it all out. I don't just want to query it. I want to get yeah. my data back. No, those are great questions. So um, we're trying to reduce the time it takes to process data. And for smaller accounts, generally the data will be done faster. So we're always trying to improve that. And so it really depends on the size of the account. So when we process YouTube, it takes a little bit more time than we process maybe like a smaller blog. Um, so, I would, so it really depends on the size. And the other question you had is how do you access all your data? So one is we, we, you know, before we didn't even have a data export API. So now we have an export API. And we're starting to allow you to access all that information. Uh, we're re reducing the quota uh, more and more. So that way you can access all the information in the account, export it out, and, and present it. I, I guess the, the big challenge when we, when we hear that is that it, it's not necessarily like a table that we store in analytics. It's more of a data cube. So the combinations of dimensions and metrics can be infinite. You can say, well, show me how many, you know, show me the visits and, you know, visits and page views from cities that start with M, right? Uh, well, that's a query. I mean, I, you have raw data sitting somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't care what format it's in. You can give it to me in any format you like. Sure. Uh, but I mean, the data export API is not an export API. It's a query API. I can make any query I want, but I can't get my, all my data back out again. And that, yeah, you know, no. like a data dump. Sure. It's definitely something we've heard a lot. Um, you know, maybe we can talk about uh, some more of your use cases after that, uh, after this session, so we can get, you know, we can help better understand it. Okay, thanks. Sure, I'll put it in the back. Yeah, um, so I've been uh, spending the past couple of days uh, thinking about the async uh, JavaScript code, and it looks to me sort of like you've, you've moved into a, a, almost a declarative programming paradigm. I, I sort of write out a list of things I wanna do, and I, push them onto a stack, and, and then it gets executed somehow. Mm -hmm. um, what was the design philosophy behind that? Why'd you go that way? It's a great question. So first, we wanted to do async right, to make the web faster so it could load on the majority of browsers. The challenge, though, is that when we're telling people to track before the object to track is even there, we needed a, a simple mechanism so that we, we can queue up requests and then execute them later. So to keep it simple, we just created an array so that way you can push these commands as a command array onto them. Okay. So it's more of a, a function of how do we allow you to track before you can even track, and then make it simple so you can continue to track after you can really send data to our services. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have a question also feature related to uh, um, where our sort of synchronized uh, synchronicity. Uh, if there, uh, if, say for example, I, I have a web application it's a premium user application, the user pays, pays for it, and it, uh, I don't know, it's sort of like, uh, whatever, a uh, calendar. Can I put um, event tracking codes into every single of the buttons into my UI to track, uh, and use the data, the data export the API to bring that information back down and sort of make a heat map of the application as it's used? Can, can I query for each of the buttons and each of the buttons be brought back and sort of if, even if it's copy pasted, I don't care doing it once a day. I don't need it in real time. But can I do that? That? Yeah, you can. You can use events tracking. There's one limitation on events. You can send 500 events per session currently, uh, and okay. that's a limitation in. Uh, well, that's just a restriction that we have in the JavaScript. Mm -hmm. But uh, the way people would typically track where people are interacting is like if you have an ID for each of those buttons. Mm -hmm. That's like a DOM element. That's mm -hmm. defined as an ID attribute. You can mm -hmm. pass the ID as one of the parameters to event tracking. So that way you know where to actually draw the, the, the information on top of that. Okay, it's definitely possible. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hi, uh, if I have an application like a Google Earth or Google Maps based application, would I be able to track like where the user is navigating or you know, the clicking on Google Earth? That's a good question. So if you're able to listen to the events of somebody interacting with the map in the function handler, you can then issue tracking code, uh, execute event tracking to Google Analytics. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, right now you allow one account code per page, is that correct? Uh, so the best practice is to use one account code per page, but many people, I've seen up to five on a page. So uh, you, you can definitely add more. There are certain implications on doing that, so we don't, we don't promote it because weird things could happen uh, with the data, but it's definitely possible. Okay, by weird thing, well, okay, the reason why I'm asking is what our application does is it 
uh, modifies a customer's web page. So they have their own analytics that they want to do, mm -hmm. and we want to be able to, as part of our verification, include our, our own code as well. Sure. Um, so that was, that's the reason why it would be very valuable for us. Yeah. No, so a lot of people do that today. The challenge is, is that our persistence to track the visitor session actually happens in a cookie, and there's only one cookie namespace that we use. So both tracking codes are actually using the same cookie set. So what that means is that if you have, uh, if, you, if the client is tracking 100 pages and you're only tracking a subset of maybe 50 pages, you guys are still going to be using the same session information. So a person could come to their tracking code and be counted as a first-time visitor, uh, and then come to your tracking code and they'll look like a brand new, you know, they'll look like a return visitor, even though it's the first time they they were on your page. So it's more of an issue with the way the cookies in the storage works. Um, but it's definitely possible for like interaction information, like page views and visitor information, because the, the visitor never changes. Well, it'd be nice if you could look at uh, making that more, more, more possible, because I'm sure. sure I'm not the only one in here who does things like widgets and such like that. Sure. Um, and a related question is, uh, because of our customers tend to be rather unsophisticated, um, have you thought about connecting the analytics directly to a Google spreadsheet? That's a great question. Um, we, we have. We've talked to the spreadsheet team. Uh, recently, they released what's called AppScript. And there's actually a, a guy who's out in, um, in Europe who actually created scripts that actually can do that today. So, that, so that's actually available. Um, just search for you know, Google AppScripts analytics, and he'll give you actually the code. So you can start doing that today. OK, and the last question I have promise, um, is uh, the world is not organized really around political boundaries. If you think about New York City, mm -hmm. right next to New Jersey, sure. but upstate New York is a whole lot different than New York City proper. And so being able to do a query based upon urban region, if you will, sure. is really kind of critical. Because, um, I mean, if you talk to someone who's from New York, they talk about the Bronx is different than Manhattan, for example. Right. Um, but even in the Bay Area, San Francisco, I'm sorry, San Jose, South San Jose is different than like, closer to Mountain View and so on. Mm -hmm. It depends upon, you know, your target market, but being able to query based upon some sort of non-political boundary. Right. No, that's a good question. So the standard reports is continent, subcontinent, uh, country, region or state and city. We also expose the latitude and longitude through our data export API. So you're able to use that. And you can actually see a demo of how people have integrated map data with uh, Google Earth outside in, in the sandbox. So we have some of that capability, but I, but I would completely agree. It could be more flexible. The US Census kind of codes things. Sure. US Department. So that's, a, that's actually a great question. So there's certain IDs that you're probably accessing, like the, the DMA ID or the US Census ID. <laughs> um, we'd love to hear kind of what those would be great, most useful for you. Are there any plans to support more, uh, I don't know if you addressed this earlier, but more page views? I think you guys are capping out at like 30 million or something like that. Right, so um, it, it really depends. So there's two types of, you know, for advertisers who link their analytics and, and uh, AdWords accounts, we ask that they no, send no more than 30 million page views per day. Um, now, after and beyond that, it becomes hard to really understand like what's the additional value because you have such a great sample set. So we typically ask those people to enable what's called sampling. So you would only get a percentage of those visitors. And, and generally, when you're looking at analytics, none of the data is going to be absolute. What you're really looking for are more of relative trends. So today we are at 100, and then we launched a product. Now we're at 10,000. So that increase in traffic is the most important part. And that's typically worked well. Um, so currently, I mean, those are the limits. You could, I mean, that's what we state. Um, you could send more, but you know, it's not what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah. I have um, two or 300 insurance websites that um, all use analytics. Mm -hmm. On each of the sites, they link to another one of our servers that uh, provides security for forms, um, auto home, cool forms, stuff like that. Sure. Is there a way, or what is the best way, to incorporate the analytics on my individual sites with their specific forms on a separate server? That's a good question. So the, the main issue, it depends. Our persistence all ba are based on cookies. So all the information of where they came from, the visitor ID, all that information is in a cookie. So the, the key thing is to make sure that you can read that information on these other sites. 
If it's, the same, if, it's, if it's the same domain, you're able to read a cookie. If it's a different domain, then what you have, we have a couple methods that allow you to serialize all the cookie information and pass that to your server. And then there's a method which, when enabled, it'll look for the, uh, the query parameter of the final page to see if that information is there. And if it is, it'll reset the cookie instead of creating a new one. So the idea is to pass all the cookie information through the query parameters. OK. And w one of the issues we have is some of the forms are four or five, six pages long. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out which questions are getting people to stop filling the form out. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I, I think I kind of understand what you're saying with the cookies to allow, because the secure server all uses the same domain. Sure. So each of the sites uses the same domain for mm -hmm. that. Now, is that a setting I just change in the code that I embed into the sites, or? Exactly. So everything we track is based on the account ID that you put on the page. Okay. Right. So what you want to do is say, this person came from site A, serialize the cookie, send it over to the new domain, reset the cookies, make sure you're using the proper ID, track all the pages. From the analytics side, it'll look like the same user was going across all the pages. On the final form, you set up funnel goals, funnel uh, goals, and funnel abandonment. You can see where people drop off. And then you can use our export API. Yeah, it's exciting. And one more question real quick. Is there a way to have more than 50 sites per account? Yeah, it's, it's generally 50. Um, you know, there's certain, if you have like an account manager with AdWords, you can work with them to try to increase that. Uh, if you're reaching to the 50 part, you probably most likely want to start moving over to starting to use new accounts. Uh, and so you can sign up for any account, as many accounts as you want for free. Which is what I've done. It's just kind of hard to manage when I have six different sub-accounts, I have to figure out which site is located on, you know, in which one. Sure, sure. OK, thank yeah. you. OK. I'd like to ask about uh, uh, getting a notification, uh, tracking of uh, YouTube uh, videos. Sure. In two, two cases. One case, the video is on embedded on my site. Mm -hmm. The other one, that uh, YouTube is on YouTube. Right. But I'd like to find out, for example, uh, click stop start are the people watching like time span on the video sure so when the video is embedded on YouTube there's currently no way for you to actually add tracking code to YouTube right so YouTube actually has their own product called YouTube insights which actually looks at how many people drop off from your video when you're watching it I would take a look for that because they have an API to also access their YouTube insights information now if you take that video and you embed it on your own site um, YouTube has what's called a JavaScript player. There, there's two ways. There's one where you just do the embed code, and it, it you have no access to the interactions. YouTube also has an embed API. It's all JavaScript-based. What that means is you can listen to the events when people click on different buttons. And so when you, peop when you actually set up an event handler, you can actually track events um, when people click a link. And, and you know the best practice is, is that you don't want to track like every five seconds. You want to track percentages of views, right? So how many people got 50% through? How many people got 20% through? That, that type of information. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what if you want to switch uh, from to Google Analytics from, an, uh, from the old data? So I have sure. a lot of old data in our data database, and we want to switch to Google Analytics. But it's right. better if to have everything on the same place and not. That's a good question. Yeah, at this time, we don't have a way to import your historical aggregated data. Mm -hmm. uh, the, my recommendation is to just implement Google Analytics today and continue using the systems for a little while. Um, what you'll notice then is that the absolute numbers will be different, but the trends will be the same. And so over time, you can start relying, hey, you know, we're using Google Analytics, but this older system is still in place in case we need the historical data. Eventually, there'll become a point where we'll be like, we don't need the older data. We just, we'll keep it, but we don't need to keep on collecting it. Mm -hmm. Sure. OK. So for me, fundamentally, the issue with analytics is a signal to noise ratio. Sorry, I'm going to tilt it up a little bit here. Okay. Um, one question I have is why you don't offer the option to put in like the public facing IP address of your company. One of the problems I have is our product people come up with a great idea, they launch the product, and then they spend all day looking at it. And our, you know, we see a spike in traffic, yeah. but it's all coming from our office when I actually sure. dig into the logs. So why not offer the ability to filter a, a set or a particular I, API or a IP address? Sure. So that's a great question. And actually, that feature is available today. And so the way we track at Google is that we have a site where we tell people, hey, if you want to uh, set up internal analytics, just sign up for Google Analytics. And there's a place in the administrative section which allows you to create filters. And filters, what happens, if you remember the, the part of the slides where I talked to how we process data, 
right before we create, right before we actually do the processing of the data, we apply these filters to all the data that's collected, which allows you to manipulate the data. For example, filter out anybody who comes from this IP range. You can use a regular expression to do that. And when you do that, that means if you know the, the bank of IPs that people are coming from your internal network, you can make sure that doesn't get collected in the profile you view. So, so the best practice is you collect all your data and you report it in one profile. You create a new profile that uses the same data but filters out all the internal traffic. So you have like what's called a clean profile. And so that's available today. If you take a look in our help center about profile filters, you'll see how, how that's done. So the set, that's the easy case. I, it seems like it should just be a part of config. And I mean, creating filters is fine and it's doable, but sure. that's just kind of, it seems like usability, that's kind of poor. Yeah, no, I but, mean, it can be made a lot easier and, and definitely, and that's something but, that we are addressing. So one of the things we've noticed this year is we've had an incredible spike in, let's call them bad actor bots. Um, seen a large number of crawlers that are not, you know, they're using things like um, Tor networks and other things to kind of spoof IPs and, or using zombie hosts to do crawling. What are you guys doing to uh, um, actively identify those and try and filter them out of the results? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, so you know we're 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 enabling you to to filter out the traffic that we can collect, and we're trying to ex give you more insight into how we're collecting and processing the data. Um, so that way, if you guys find out these anomalies, you can actually then set up your own filters to to filter them out. We recently released a feature called Intelligence. So if you do see a spike, we'll alert you to the fact that that spike has happened, so you don't have to spend all the time digging through the data. So it's definitely a challenge for us to identify random people who create spikes on your site, but we're, we're trying. Great, does anybody have any other questions? Sure. If we, um, if we develop the async uh, tracking code, is there an expected difference in the numbers? Say you had two parallel universes, one with the old tracking code, and then one with the async code? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think if you change anything on your site, something's gonna probably you know, be impacted. Uh, the traditional way we told you to track with the original code, was put, to put the code at the bottom of the page because the, the code was loading synchronously and we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to reduce uh, user perceived latency. But now that we put the code at the top of the page, it's more likely if you have like a lot of content that some of the tracking uh, that might have, you know, if people were, if a lot of content was loading on the page and people were clicking away, potentially they might not have tracked. So by putting the code at the top of the page, we're guaranteeing that we're gonna collect more data. So usually you might get a, a better picture with async. A yeah. couple, couple more questions, uh, hopefully quick. So, <clears throat> what, uh, for, uh, first question is, uh, is there a way to uh, simulate the uh, originating IP of the request so that I, uh, I, can, I can send, uh, send the, um, collect the data from, from some other host other than the client's computer? Sure. Yeah, currently there's, there's no publicly supported way to do that, um, but we've heard that from a lot of people when we're looking at it, yeah. Okay, and the second one, uh, is there a way you can uh, kind of open the code of the tracker because right now it's kind of uh, um, garbled. So yeah. is there a way to a have question. a look at it just, just to learn? Yeah, no, exactly. It's a great question. So currently, no, uh, it's closed. But as I mentioned, what we're trying to do really is open up the whole collection side of the platform. We want to have a supported protocol that will document so you'll know exactly what data is being sent. And that way you can create your own kind of open libraries as well. So it, it's something we currently not, are not having today, but we definitely want to engage with the developer community to have that type of uh, you know, open library. So any idea as to when? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good question, because every time I try to say a date, it always, or I hear a date, it always gets pushed back. So it's something we're, we're actively working on. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, first off, Google Analytics is awesome, and I can't believe it's free, it's really cool. <laughs> but uh, I was well, just- so, so if you think it's awesome, there's a guy back there that you might want to just uh, tell him how awesome it is. <laughs> Uh, so my question was, uh, what's the delay from when a user visits the site to what, uh, when that data is available in the dashboard? That's a great question. It really depends on the size of the data we're processing. We're trying to reduce that time, you know, reduce that more and more. We don't publicly give out the exact information. In fact, for our API, we say to be safe, you'll get, you know, after 24 hours, you can be sure like the data won't be changing. Um, but we're, we're reducing it all the time. And so uh, what I would recommend, you know, if, if you have a little, like a, a Google gadget or something that's querying your API, you can always see, you know, like when was the last time that data was updated. Um, so it really depends on the size of the account. 
Okay, cool. And my other question was, is there any trouble with like Black Hat SEO if you're using the search data to modify what the page is serving up based on the queries that are coming in? So, for example, if someone comes in from a specific Google search, you want to modify the page based on the analytics data to give them something that's more appropriate as like does the SEO side of things, do they look down on that? That's a good question. You'd have to talk to someone like Matt Cutts to, to okay, tell you the exact him. how they're how they're doing stuff. Um, but you know, in the case of the example I was showing, we we're just showing dynamic pages based on data. It's a little bit more targeted. So, uh, you know, if it's dynamic, it shouldn't be a problem. Cool. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions? Great. Thanks, guys.